Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's University of Birmingham Business Club webinar. We're talking about uh, inclusive workplaces today in our Building Back Better Workplaces panel discussion. And we would like to welcome everybody to today's webinar, which is part of Growth Through People's campaign at the Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce. Our chair for today is Professor Joanne Dubley, who's co-director of the Work Inclusivity Research Centre, which are sponsoring this year's Growth Through People campaign. And also Joe is Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. So I'd like to welcome Joe to tell us a bit more about the Work Inclusivity Research Centre. Hi there, I'm absolutely delighted to chair this panel discussing how we can build back better and more inclusive workplaces in the post-COVID era. It's a really important discussion for us to have now because it's, although it's clear that we're going to face challenging times ahead, I think the potential business benefits that diverse and inclusive workplaces can create are pretty well rehearsed. So in building back better, we have the opportunity to enhance our levels of diversity and inclusion and create workplaces where all staff can flourish and reach their potential. How we develop more inclusive organisations is the central focus of the Work Inclusivity Research Centre, which I co-direct here at the University of Birmingham with my colleague, Dr Holly Burkett. The centre brings together academics, practitioners and policymakers to increase understanding around issues of equality, diversity and inclusion in employment. My own area of research tend to focus on issues of gender and age. So, for example, I've undertaken projects looking at how to attract, develop and retain women in engineering. But within the centre, we've got really fantastic teams of people who focus on issues such as trust, um, flexible working, well-being and employee voice and they're looking at how we can develop more inclusive organisations with using those criteria. The conversation is also close to my heart because in addition to my academic research related role I'm also an EDI practitioner in that I am the strategic lead for equality, diversity and inclusion here at the University of Birmingham. And that gives me a fascinating opportunity to try and put some of the academic research around EDI into practice in my own organisation. And I think from doing both roles, I recognise just how challenging that can be. Um, and it's really highlighted to me the importance of co-produced research and the need to build a solid evidence base for EDI related change, because we learn so much from trying to put things in practice. So essentially, I am convinced that researchers, educators and practitioners need to work together if we're going to have a serious impact on the levels of inclusion at work. To address the issues of building back better, we have a wonderful panel of speakers who all share a real passion for diversity and inclusion and really do bring together those academic and practitioner perspectives. Firstly, we have Cathy Professor Cathy Cassell, Dean of Birmingham Business School. Cathy is the first female Dean and has had a huge impact on the school since she arrived, putting responsible business at the heart of the school's strategy and making it central to everything we do. She's also an occupational psychologist by trade and has done amazing research into diversity and inclusion over the last 20 year, years, which I'm sure she will draw on in today's discussion. We're also very lucky to have Pam Shemar with us. Pam is Regional Ecosystem Manager for NatWest. She's played a huge role supporting and developing entrepreneurs in the area through the Birmingham Entrepreneur Accelerator. And amongst the many other things she does for the city region, Pam is also Executive Board Member of the Asia, Asian Chamber of Commerce and a Board Director for Birmingham Tech Week, championing tech across the region. Next, we have Henrietta Brearley, and you might have seen that Henrietta has recently been promoted to Chief Executive of Birmingham Chamber of Commerce. Her work at the forefront of the Chamber's campaigns around Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic has been acclaimed by many stakeholders at both regional and national levels. levels. Henrietta is also a great friend of the university. She is an alumni and a trustee of the University of Birmingham's Guild of Students. 
Finally, she's also a graduate and supporter of the amazing Uprising Leadership Programme, which aims to diversify leadership by giving young people important skills such as networking and advocacy. Um, and it really focuses on people from diverse backgrounds, so I'm hoping we might hear a bit more about that during the session. Then finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Scott Taylor. Scott is an Associate Professor and a leading member of the Work Inclusivity Research Centre. He's particularly interested in the role of men in creating inclusive workplaces. And Scott's work has been really influential in forming government departments and ACAS training methods, amongst other things. So in a moment, I will hand over to each of the panelists to tell us about their background and why they think diversity inclusion is so important. I'm sure this is going to be a really engaging discussion and I invite you, the audience, to play a key part in that. Obviously, I've got a few questions I'd like to ask them, but I really would like to hear from you. So please do, if you have any questions, post them in the Q&A. Don't be shy. I will put the questions to the panellists that are, that are posted there. Great. So with no further ado, I'm going to invite the panellists to turn their cameras on and each of them to give a short introduction. And we'll start with Cathy uh, Cassell, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to see you this morning. And um, thank you, Joe, for a wonderful introduction. <laughs> That's great, thanks. Um, so just a, bit, a brief introduction to me. As Joe said, I'm an organizational psychologist by background. And so I passionately believe that work has a really important impact on people's health. Um, and their psychological health, particularly. It might be um, their experiences at work, their experiences of non-work, or their experiences of managing work and other aspects of, not, of, of um, life. But that's my academic background, and that frames how I look at, at, at these kinds of issues. Uh, my day job, if you like, is I'm the Dean of Birmingham Business School. We are one of the largest business schools in the UK. Uh, we're what's known as a full service business school. So we do all different kinds of programs, undergraduate, postgraduate, MBAs, etc. And we also do some wonderful research. And as Joe's outlined, the Work and Inclusivity Research Centre is part of that. Um, so I'm really interested in EDI practices, processes, policies, because it's really important for how people experience their everyday lives at work. Um, and clearly, as Joe said, we know it has an impact on how successful organisations are. So I'm really committed to the idea that we try to create a business school in which our colleagues and our students can thrive. And in order to do that, EDI is absolutely central to that process. We also, as Joe says, have a um, a commitment to responsible business um, and we, we are training the responsible managers of the future the responsible leaders of the future and we think that's a really important part of our work and again EDI is crucial to that finally as joe says i've done lots of research in this area over 20 years she was a bit kind of a bit older than that actually might even be longer but let's not go there um, and I think in, in terms of summarising it, I thought the easiest way of summarising it is to tell you the two things that I'm kind of working on. The most recent thing I've had published is a study that involves a major high street retailer, and it's about how we define inclusion and how inclusion is quite a fragile concept. So, you know, there are things, uh, practices or experiences that make us feel included, as well as potentially make other people feel excluded. And it's about how we manage the fragility of inclusion to ensure that, that as many people as possible feel included. Um, and I can talk about that if necessary. And the other is something I'm in the middle of writing up, which is a really interesting study, you can tell I'm an academic, really interesting study about couples, heterosexual couples, how they manage work-life balance and, and where couples want to be egalitarian, what it is that makes those who are egalitarian successful in managing to do that. So those, that's a flavour of the kind of stuff that I do. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the session. And thanks for inviting me to be part of it. Great, thank you, Cathy. If we could now pass over to Pam. Hi everyone, morning. Um, delighted to be here. So I kind of, kind of wear a few hats, but I'm going to talk about um, the, the first thing that we're doing at NatWest is um, our strapline is we're really purpose led. Um, so helping businesses, communities and um, people to thrive, especially removing barriers for those who might experience them. And actually COVID in itself has affected so many people in different ways. 
So entrepreneurs, for example, especially female entrepreneurs, that's one of the things we're really championing. And our CEO, Alison Rose, um, conducted a, a white paper report called the Rose Review, which led to some really interesting data on, um, on how um, different groups of people are underrepresented groups are impacted differently. And that's led, led to a stream of, stream of activities um, such as extra funding, um, such as extra support for female entrepreneurs, such as um, extra support for underrepresented, especially ethnic diversity groups as well. Um, so there's loads of work that's been done, and I really champion the diversity and inclusion piece on that. Now, as employee as well, one of the things I'm really, really proud of is um, our organization has really kind of um, opened the dialogue on, on bringing your whole self to work in terms of being inclusive, being um, an, a diverse, inclusive organization. And I think when we've got um, over 50 case, 50,000 staff working from home now, how do you still feel part? Yeah, how do you still feel connected in a digital world? And one of the main, one of the key things we've done is um, the employer-led networks, which are employee-led, they're um, exec-sponsored, but everything from gender networks to rainbow to faith networks and education. And that's been a real kind of driving force and keeping people really involved, but really opening up those conversations. Now, one of those conversations has led to me um, conducting and um, starting a new pilot um, with, uh, with my employee and we're calling it the Midlands and his corporate and commercial career acceleration pilot program and the purpose of that is um, to remove barriers to help um, accelerate and drive um, skills and talent to those higher CEO positions and um, so that's something I'm really passionate about um, I love um, the, the conversation that's going to happen today I can feel the energy already um, from Kathy uh, so really looking forward to that and also being part of the um, Asian Chamber of Commerce um, that's again about helping those underrepresented voices. And me being a female from a diverse background, a lot of that is lived experience as well. So seeing some of those barriers and how you know the social mobility element comes into it as well. And from a tech perspective, making sure tech is inclusive as well. So I think you know, a lot of some women don't go into tech because they might be now dominated, but making sure that's inclusive as well. So that's where that adds in. So I'm looking forward to today. There's lots to talk about, um, but I'll hand over to you, Joe. Great, thanks Pam. Um, if I could invite Henrietta to come on, on along now to introduce herself. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I work for the Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce, which some of you on the uh, webinar may be aware of, but for those who are less so, it's a not-for-profit business membership and business support organisation that exists to connect, support and grow local businesses. We've actually got around 90 members of staff helping businesses with absolutely everything from finding customers locally to trading internationally. But one of the areas that I'm responsible for is policy and strategic relationships which is one of those buzzwords that often uh, sort of leaves people looking a bit baffled. Uh, but what we really do within policy and strategic relationships is research, inform and engage. We find out what businesses are thinking and feeling about things. We inform them about best practice, new developments to be aware of, policy changes to adapt to, and we engage. We campaign on their behalf, often sort of picking up lobbying calls for action, particularly in recent times around Brexit and COVID-19. But one core area that we continually focus on is leadership and people management skills, and within that diversity and inclusivity. You know, Joe mentioned at the start of this that we're currently running our growth through people campaign. It's the fourth year that we've run it. It's a mix of totally free workshops, conferences, etc., to really inform the local business community about best practice on leadership and people management. So it's honestly through leaders and through line managers that a lot of the key skills around diversity and inclusion are sort of brought to life. It's those people in the business who are responsible for making it a reality. Uh, and it's something that we've increasingly seen the business community wanting to do more on. I, th I think there's a genuine understanding that actually our leadership in the city, whether it's business, civic, beyond, it doesn't reflect the diversity of this city. And that is an issue. You know, you can't, can't not see there must be a structural issue here when you look at the top and then you look at the population. So there's an attitude of wanting to do more, but what's often missing is that how do we do it? You know, we've got the right intentions. What are the actions that we need to put in place and hold ourselves accountable for and hold a mirror up to ourselves for to make sure that we're doing it properly? And that's why we're so delighted to be working with the University of Birmingham's Work Inclusivity Research Centre uh, and also to be continuing to bring greater people and try and get some of those skills coming through, keep feeding that through and keeping the conversation moving year after year. Personally, it's something that I'm very passionate about. You know, speaking of lived experience, I was 25 when I started my role as Director of Policy and Strategic Relationships. 
And let me tell you, walking into often sort of round table discussions, already a weird thing that the business community do, this sort of stakeholder round table discussions. <laughs> but walking in as a 25 year old woman and occasionally on some circumstances, being A, the only woman in the room, which is depressing to say in a 2021. Uh, and be the only person sort of under under 40 to 50, you do sort of feel that sense of otherness and difference without anyone intending it, but you can feel it and you start to understand how this can really be an issue that happens, you know, how these sort of separations, how people can feel excluded uh, and the needs to really sort of take action to make sure that that doesn't keep happening and we break down those barriers and people in future don't have the same feeling that I did walking into those rooms and going wow no one here looks like me and I'm saying that as a white middle class person <laughs> so you know there's a lot more to be done here and it's something that I'm personally passionate about you know Joe touched on my experience with the uprising leadership program we may come back to that more later happy to talk about that uh, but really something that I know we need to do more on and we're keen to play our part as a chamber that convenes businesses, brings businesses together to get some of that learning going out and really turning this from a conversation and into action in individual businesses. Fabulous, thanks Henrietta. Um, and over to Scott. Thank you very much, Joe. It's lovely to be here, um, especially because I get the impression that this is going to be um, an optimistic uh, sort of 45 minutes or so that we've got here today uh, from the title of Build Back Better. And this is the, the second sort of forward looking workshop that I've attended this week. Uh, I have to say the first one didn't end well. We were looking for um, optimistic things going forward, going forward, and most of us struggled to find things. But um, I think it's going to be a much more generative conversation today, which would be really good. Um, as Joe mentioned, I work with um, uh, Kathy at Business School. Kathy is my, my line manager. Hello, Kathy. I haven't seen Kathy um, on campus for, for more than a year now. Um, and uh, I mostly teach um, leadership studies to undergraduates on campus. Um, and the, the sort of research interest that I have in this area really came from, uh, came from that work about 10 years ago, because every year with this group of final year undergraduates, we do a survey of um, leadership diversity in the UK. And we do it in the module, um, during the module in real time. And every year, um, it, it's, it's quite sad to watch their faces slowly fall as they realize that the lack of diversity in the UK's largest, most prestigious organizations. And every year they tell me that it's going to get better and it doesn't get better. It hasn't got better over the last 10 years. Um, so, so from that, that teaching, I started to um, research feminism in workplaces and particularly the work of Laura Bates um, in looking at everyday sexism in workplaces in the UK. Um, and then more recently, I decided that it was time to um, actually sort of take some, some individual responsibilities and lived experiential responsibility for the, the position that we find ourselves in at the moment in terms of EDI, where there has been an enormous amount of progress, but there's still so much more to do. So I've started to research the, um, the, the, the role of um, men, particularly men like me, white middle-aged men um, in workplaces in the UK and um, our potential contribution to EDI. Hopefully not in the way of um, uh, people like me telling um, women and people of color what to do, uh, maybe more in terms of um, making a bit of space and uh, listening and um, speaking up as well when we see things which um, don't contribute towards EDI. So fingers crossed, a nice positive session. No pressure, you know, back to you. Thank you, Scott. Well, you know me, I am ever the optimist. So, uh, so I mean, fantastic introductions for everyone. And I think really highlight just how important this issue is and the passion that people feel for it. I'm gonna start with my first question really, which is around, um, what, we talk about the need for more inclusive workplaces and we say that they're good and they will be better for, for people because they'll be more committed, they'll be better for businesses, so that they'll, they'll get performance benefits. But what would a more inclusive workplace look like? So given that we are coming into the post-COVID era, what, uh, era, era what, what should businesses be aiming for? What kinds of things perhaps should they be doing to create that inclusive environment? And I, I'm going to leave it for volunteers to come first, but if nobody does volunteer, I will pick on you. 
happy to volunteer. Um, I think I'm really at the heart of it, I, I think inclusive workplaces are transparent. You know, it's a transparent how you get opportunities to join the workforce, get opportunities to progress within the workforce, really transparent. Um, also, they uh, prioritise putting in place talent pipelines, developing people, and then also tackling bias at every single stage, recognising it exists in all of us, uh, and then tackling it at every single stage in the business, which sounds really easy when you sort of summarise it in sort of three bullet points, but it's actually unbelievably difficult. And I, I don't think any business would stand up and say, we've got this 100%. You know, certainly I know we haven't in our organisation, we're always looking at what we need to do better. Um, but that sort of conscious approach, knowing that's what you're aiming for, and then putting in place interventions, which I suspect some of your colleagues will be able to tell us much more on. Uh, to uh, to get us there. That's really what I see as a, an inclusive workplace. Brilliant. Thanks, Henrietta. Did anybody else want to add to that? Pam, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, sure. I think for me, it's um, about building a, a, a great place to work where there's an open dialogue. And aspirationally for me, I'd love to see um, organisations reflect the customers and the communities we serve. And actually what I'm seeing is not that. So I think um, open dialogue is really important, but then addressing why is that happening? You know, is there any systematic barriers that's holding people back? Is there any practical barriers? Is it a, a, a social mobility issue? Is it a, is it a, a learning issue, you know? Um, and I think we know that personally for me, the, the dynamics of my family would be different from another family. So I think it's really getting to know your people and understanding how you can champion potential, but champion everybody individually. I think that takes a real listening organization. But I think we have got the, the tools and the power to do that. So that's that's what, it, so it's removing barriers in a constructive way to make sure that we can break down those barriers that's not leading to that inclusion piece. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and actually, I, it really resonates with me because when I look at the University of Birmingham and our staff, obviously, you know, we have to be honest, we don't reflect the city of Birmingham. So one of the things is we've got to become a more attractive employer and also where people, I, I thought earlier when you talked about that authentic piece, you know, people being able to be themselves. I think that's something we really need to work on. Um, Kathy or Scott, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think sometimes um, when, so some of the research I've done recently suggests that, um, uh, you know, when, when, when we create networks, which, which Pam talked about earlier, those are really important um, in terms of particular groups. But often it's creating a culture where somebody who might, for individual reasons, be experiencing something at work, which might not necessarily fit into, a, you know, a, might not be about age or gender or, or being a colour or whatever, there is still the opportunity for them to be understood, listened to and for um sensitivity to those individual circumstances it's it's it's, it's kind of quite hard to explain but for example in in, in this retailer where, where where i did some work um it was quite apparent that the fact that that, that there are groups for, 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 for people of color for, for um parents etc cetera, etc cetera, it's not only good for those groups but it sends an important message for people who are not in those categories so you know the fact that there is um a, 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 a a network where I am for um, minority ethnic workers sends me a message. I might not be part of that network, but it shows sends me a message that that my organisation is committed to inclusivity. So it's how we, but where people really felt included was where somebody at work might have had an incident, you know, a member of their family might have been sick or, you know, so something like that happened. And there weren't any particular policies around it, but it was paid attention to in a sympathetic way. And so that's quite interesting because we're quite used to, we know who doesn't feel, ex, we know who potentially feels excluded by group, and we've talked about quite a few of those things, including our own experience, like Henrietta talking about her own experience. But I think inclusion is also about everybody and having general policies so that whatever it is about your experience, your employer can create an environment where you can work to your best. And I think what's really interesting about what's happened recently is COVID's exposed a lot of that because so many people have such different circumstances. You know, we never used to have to think, about, you know, we've got people losing people, people who can't sick people, people. We've got so many different things people with children at home so I think that's exposed just how important it is to think about a majority thing but also what we can how we can support individually 
hope, I hope I've made sense. I feel like I'm rambling a bit. I hope I've made sense. <laughs> no, that's, I, I think that's a great point. But actually, it, it then also uh, relates back to Henrietta's point, I think, about um, the importance of line managers in, in this, because I, I know myself, it's all very well to develop beautiful EDI policies, but it's about that personal touch, isn't it? It's about how, you're, how the people around you treat you. Um, and as you say, Cathy, that, that sense of you know, understanding and openness. Scott, did you want to add anything on this? Just, just really quickly, I think um, all three have already said um, really sort of pointed and interesting things, um, but just really quickly on, on, on the sort of exposure um, I think all workplaces have been made more transparent over the last 12 months because, because we've taken them home. We're all, uh, well, many of us are, are at home trying to work. And I think I saw a cat's tail at one point uh, on, on one of the, the, the images this morning. And like Kathy was saying, you know, we've seen kids, we've seen uh, all sorts of animals. We've seen people, I've seen people sort of cleaning their kitchens. Um, I gave a lecture a couple of weeks ago where one of the students was in a car being, being driven through a city in central China, uh, and that was unfolding in the, in the background while he was taking notes. He was doing a really good job, bless him. Um, but I think um, all of our workplaces have, have been sort of opened up over the last 12 months, and, and that includes the kind of norms that we were working to. And I think um, just to, to add to what Cathy was saying in particular, that um, the, the, the convention of working, of being present from 7.30 in the morning until 6.30 at night or beyond um, is, is something that I think is going to be very, very difficult to go back to. Um, and fingers crossed, if we can flex a little bit more with that, then we might, we might end up with more inclusive workplaces. Actually, that's a really interesting point, I think, because um, I, I, I totally agree in, in terms of, you know, the, there is a potential for flexibility there, but the presenteeism bit, I wonder whether we have lost that because I, I certainly hear reports from people about being technically or digitally present and actually having longer days as a result of, of, of this uh, you know, current situation. So it's, it's interesting. I think it's both a challenge and an opportunity, I guess, like most things in life. Um, actually, just because we've been we've been sort of talking about COVID and, and its impact on inclusion, I, I think I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on that. So, you know, we are in a position where people have been working from home. We have had more flexibility. For some people, that has been really quite difficult, you know, combined in homeschooling, caring responsibilities. For others, you know, they, they've been able to, well, I wouldn't say necessarily enjoy, but, you know, it, it has been a, a less stressed experience. I'm really keen to hear what you think we've learned from the COVID experience that we can take forward. So if you, you know, to the, to the, to the business people here, what sort of, you know, what recommendations would you make in terms of to take forward from our COVID experience? Henrietta, do you, would you like to have a start? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, from my side, there are a couple of things, you know, you mentioned, mentioned the working from home, flexible working, et cetera. Actually, does that end presenteeism? And we've just been doing a bit of a internal engagement and sort of, you know, checking in on health and safety. That's an exciting thing, um, but has actually thrown up um, at some concerns from staff that they don't feel able to take breaks. You know, they, they feel sort of like they're, they need to be glued to the screen uh, nine to five, where actually if you're in the office, you're making a cup of tea, you're having a chat, you, you're giving your brain like a bit of a break and not just staring down the, the barrel of the screen. Um, so we're actually doing a bit internally at the moment on how, how we help people feel like they've got permission to walk away without being overbearing, you know, without going, these are your allocated break times during the day. Um, uh, and just how we support staff and getting to that place of it is okay to walk away, it is okay to walk in your lunch, it is okay to take a five minute break every hour if that suits you better, you know, whatever it is you want to do, just take, take some time away from the screen. But there are some plus sides from that, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of um, research on what the future of work is going to look like. Um, and actually only a small percentage of people want to stay working from home forever. You know, there's, I think, a great YouGov poll where there's about 40% can't wait to get back into the office full time. It's about 39%. Uh, and then the rest, they want a bit of a balance, you know, keep a couple of days working from home, but still going into the office, et cetera. And I think the trust that's built up between organisations and their staff to say, yeah, work from home. We've seen you do it over the last year. Uh, we've seen the amazing sort of output that people have been putting through and the trust that someone doesn't have to be physically in front of you for you to know that they're doing their job really well. 
something I'd like to see taken forwards. The other piece has been around communication. So, you know, we've, we've had to do a lot of editing as we go along over the last year. <laughs> Plans have gone out the window at a moment's notice. Things are constantly changing and evolving. Uh, and particularly within where I work around policy, uh, you know, you never know when the government's going to drop a major announcement and all sorts of things are going to change and you just need to pick it up and run with it. Um, and that sort of editing as you go along only works if everyone is staying on the same script. And the way you do that is that constant communication. So daily stand-ups, we've got daily senior team stand-ups, daily internal team stand-ups, and then very lively WhatsApp groups in between, just keeping everyone up to date, what's happening, what are we doing, etc. Um, so that everyone stays on that same page. And actually that communication, I think, is a really key part of high performing teams. And we don't want to lose that when we go back to the office. The making sure that everyone is constantly informed whenever going back to the office looks like. <laughs> uh, and keeping that lively communication and ongoing briefing and everyone working together and collaborating very, very sort of bedded into the business as we uh, emerge into whatever happens moving forward. Excellent, thank you. Um, anybody else, any thoughts on that? Um, I'll, I'll, oh, sorry, Pam. No, I was going to say, um, I think one of the biggest learnings for us is, um, um, for, for, is everyone's experience of COVID has been different, like you've said. So I think um, the, um, I think a big one for me is learning and training. Mm -hmm. So how, how if we, how, how have, we've had people change jobs, we've had apprentices and graduates and, and people like that start, but how do you still, have those water cooler moments? How do you still have those, those training um, digitally? How do you make sure that everyone's still included? Um, and a build on that is there's an assumption that everybody has the same tools and kit at home, but the amount of digital poverty and the digital polarization in knowledge that I've seen has been immense. And actually, how do you, how do you build, bridge that gap? And I think for me, I think that's always been there. It's just been drawn out by, by, by COVID. So I think that's something that we probably need to kind of, if you are going to have a blended approach or, I mean, I mean, now I think, you know, you don't have to be in Birmingham to work in Birmingham, you know, I think that world, we had, like I was saying earlier, we had, you know, a guest join from America yesterday on one of our webinars, you know, so there's real benefits in doing things digitally, but making sure that's inclusion and also language barriers is an assumption that everybody understands tech. And actually that's one of the things, you know, I know that uh, the Asian Chamber of Commerce were, were translating um, a lot of the COVID material into different languages, multiple languages, just to make sure that inclusivity piece. Um, and then the other thing is um, just making sure that we, um, we, 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 we stay engaged. So very much to Henry's, Henry's point and that well-being perspective, you know, because again, the office is a community in a sense, but you don't know what's happening at home. And I know from, from my community, um, there's a lot of multi-generations. So how is that physical space really there? And I know one of the girls I was speaking to was literally balancing her laptop on an ironing board. You know that was the kit she had you know when she started so i think it's just that that understanding that deeper listening conversation and, and like um like i said earlier i think line managers play a huge part in that to to make that great place to work and that's one of the biggest lessons that i've seen in covid brilliant thank you thank you pam kathy you you wanted to come in too yeah, i think it's really interesting because um, scott's phrase you know people at home trying to work is exactly how we try to you know talk about that in our skill but Actually, I think it's also, you know, important for us to remember, and we do all remember because we face it every day, that we're actually at home trying to work in an extremely difficult outside environment. You know, we can't see our, fam our family, we can't see our friends. And, and so it's not just the kind of work, it's everything around it in the world that we understood as our, as, as our normal life has gone. And so I think it, it's not just about work, it's about how we support people with all the other things that, that are happening to them, I think. And I think um, in terms of what we've learned, I think if I start with the things that are perhaps more negative, one thing I've learned is that um, there's, there's more tendency for little conflicts to spiral. So I have to get involved. We're a wonderful business, so we all love each other, but occasionally people fall out. And I do feel that more people fall out than they used to. And the reason is because previously you just walked across the corridor and said to somebody, what's this about, you know? because there's none of that and it doesn't work as well on Zoom and it doesn't work. So, so, so I think we've had, people are working in different ways, which might uh, facilitate a bit more conflict in some cases. I was really, um, I was looking at some feedback. Our, our ED&I group did a series of um, 
workshops with colleagues about what they thought about ED&I and I was quite surprised to see from that, well I shouldn't be surprised, that a lot of people talked about actually wanting more kind of social events and gatherings. And so I think um, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, um, Pam and Henriette, about the impact that has had about not being able to get together in that way. And I think we've had, for example, quite a number of people have left our school and we haven't had the usual rituals about leaving. So we've said we're going to have a big party and invite everybody back once we can go back to work, just so we can make sure we can have that proper ritual to say goodbye to some colleagues. So I think those are some of the kind of negative things. And of course, there is the issue which everybody's raised, Scott. Um, talked about being in our homes and our control of boundaries is gone and often control of boundaries is really important psychologically for you to feel you know good about yourself or whatever so that's quite a challenge the positive things those who work at the university will know sometimes change takes a while in the university <laughs> we're quite big bureaucratic institutions but yes we've spent years in our school talking about um you know, oh, how do we do more online teaching? And suddenly we delivered everything online overnight. That's a massive change. So I think we've learned something about change. I'm not suggesting we see any more change like that going forward, but we've learned we can do things and we can do them well. And I think that's really interesting because those might be the kind of things that people are actually fearful of. But Luke, you know, we've done that. And I think that's a really good thing. And then for us, and this might be distinctive, I think Pam's point about internationality is really important. We can think about internationality differently. So we can have lots of international speakers coming and talking and to our, for our research seminars, you know, we're almost, we can still feel close to our international students and those kinds of things. So I think we've got lots of learning that we can take forward. Perhaps the most important being, um, as uh, Henrietta and Pam mentioned about trust as well. We need to be able to trust colleagues to work at home because they obviously do a good job doing it. Thanks. No, that's an excellent point. Actually, you know, it's really interesting you say about that ability to change. I, the, I was in, in Senate was yesterday, and we, we had this disabled student stand up and actually put us all to shame because he said, for years, I have been asking to have everything online. For years, I've been asking to have um, transcripts of, of lectures, and I haven't been able to have them. People have told me why it's not possible. And apparently, he's, he's been a student at the university for many years, six years, I think it is, and he was doing really quite badly, struggling to get a 2-2. This year, because suddenly everything is online, his performance has rocketed. And, and he said, you know, he's... Well, it was quite humbling, actually, just to hear the difference it had made to him. And it really made me think, why had we not made more of that change before? So I think a really good point, Kathy. Um, I've got a question from the audience. Well, I've got a few questions from the audience. But the first one I wanted to pose to you comes from David Coleman. And he, he's asking, what are the panel's thoughts on working on specific areas of EDI one at a time, like focusing on the experiences and opportunities for the BAME community versus targeting diversity and inclusivity as a broader issue in the workplace? And what are the challenges of either approach? I haven't spoken for a little while, I suppose, so I should probably jump in with this one. And it's also a, a really tricky question, I think, uh, which is not, not a good reason for me to speak to it. But it's, it's a, I find if I speak for a moment or so, then um, uh, we all get a, a moment to think as well. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really in favour, David, of um, uh, um, transparent quotas. Um, for, um, for example, women's representation on executive boards, and increasingly for um, for BAME representation at the highest levels of organisations as well. Um, so those are, are obviously sort of single issue, if you like, or or, or single um, uh, characteristic interventions. Um, I think if if you can change one thing then um, there's a stronger possibility that um, the, the wider culture and the, 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 the more general sort of working environment that everyone has spoken about will then start to change um, with if you if you make that basic change that most fun what i would say is a more fundamental change in in the, the, the absolute representation of people um, it, it puts a huge amount of pressure, I think, on the individuals involved. And I think that's the key issue for, um, for example, quota interventions, is that you, you put people um, right out there as, as quota people. 
and we've seen this in, in the US in particular in higher education, um, um, higher education admission systems in the US often use quotas and those students um, admitted to um, very prestigious universities on quotas can be marginalized and, and can continue to be excluded on campus in, in really unpleasant ways. So it, that's a kind of mixed answer, I think, um, that for me, the single issue or the single characteristic is a really good way to go. But there has to be a lot of cultural work which goes around that to make sure that those people um, who are put into place aren't isolated as part of that. That's what I would say. Thank you, Scott. Um, would anybody else like to have a go with that one? Henrietta? Yeah, happy to. Um, so I find that there's pros and cons to both approaches. You know, different, different groups have very different experiences and can't just be grouped together as, you know, this is a diverse group and it needs to be treated differently. It's, it's really understanding the individual lived experiences of those around you. But I do think there are some commonalities that go across all of these sorts of interventions. You know, we get approached on an almost weekly basis at times about signing up to different pledges on everything from supporting you know, mental health and well-being in the workplace, disability in the workplace, spotting risk of domestic violence, gambling addiction, alcohol addiction, um, as well as diversity and inclusion matters. And actually a lot of it, what it comes down to is how your line managers in particular, those people who are on the front end of all this, how they respond to their workforce. You know, do they see a performance or a behavioural change and just address it as something that needs to be tackled, something that needs to be put on them, you know, performance improvement, etc. Or do they listen? Do they try and understand the issues that the individual may be experiencing and connect them up to the right support? You know, do they look at the organisation structures and recognise that actually certain groups are underrepresented and then look at themselves and think, what role do I have to play in this? Uh, or do they quite happily bumble along with how things are? So all that sort of coming down to that mindset of managers within the business to think about their roles in this, I think sits at the core of a lot of this activity. Obviously leadership and direction comes from the top, but then when it comes to delivery, that, that line manager role is really critical, which you know is part of why we do grow through people as we do with that focus on leadership and people management, because it does make a huge difference, that mindset and approach. So there are a lot of cross-cutting themes, but understanding the different, different experiences of different groups really does come into that as well. Thanks. Yeah, Joe, I was going to um, build on everything that's been said there. I think um, it, it is really important, but we also know what um, what gets measured gets done as well. So I think there's, there, there's, there's pros and cons for both. I still believe that the right person should get the right job at the right time with the right talent and right qualifications. But also, they need, if, if we don't measure the what what is going through what is what is what is pipeline tra talent what, what is moving up what is changing it's never going to change and, and, that's, and a personal experience I had um, was a line manager who said to me um, I, I see you the same as everybody else and I was like mm, that's really nice but I'm not I'm nothing like the rest of the group you know for lots and lots of different things I was the only female ethnic diverse uh, lady woman there so for me that's already layers and layers of difference which I really wanted him to appreciate um, just from my, my social background, my, my education, wherever. So that there was, I could call out 50 different things that I was, how I was different. But the answer, the blanket answer of middle management was, I see you the same as everybody else. So I think for me, that was a really powerful statement in terms of how do I do this without sounding like the one that's always shouting for change. And nobody wants to be that disruptive person who's causing out, you know, um, that's in, an equal, that's an equal, you know. Um, I, I really champion that it should be in inclusive. So I think it's, I think something more needs to be done. I really like what Henry was saying about the middle management, because yes, you have the exec sponsors and you have the shouting and the sponsoring and the support and the championing there, but something probably needs to happen at that middle layer where, where that blocker happens, it doesn't go up. So I just want to add on that and build on your points there. No, that's great. Thank you, Pam. Kathy, did you have a view on this? Um, just to say, I would agree with what everybody's um, said, really. Um, Scott and Henry and Pam, um, but uh, just uh, I think I think it's important to do both. So to focus on uh, you know equality audits can help you show what are the most important single issues at a particular time. But my concern with that is always that there are a lot of things that are invisible, and the tendency is to pay attention to the real visible. Um, uh, and um, in my research recently, people have said it's great when everybody's engaged, for example, with um, uh, pride. Suddenly, you know, lots of big companies have engaged with pride and that's wonderful, but actually that's quite a nice visible 
not too challenging thing to do, some of, some of the people I've spoken to in research, whereas engaging in things like mental health in the workplace is a lot harder, actually. It's something that people don't necessarily want to talk about, don't necessarily want to share. So I think sometimes in focus on individual, perhaps group type, type issues, we might miss out on um, diverse, I mean, one of our colleagues has, has said in the chat about disability, we might miss out on some of those others less visible. Um, um, issues, I think, which is why an all-inclusive thing is really important. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right. I think there is a danger, isn't there? I mean, I'm certainly very aware in the university we are prone to um, a liking for accreditations, and accreditations can be great because they can drive change, but they can also sort of really focus you on one thing to the ignoring everything else. And it goes back to your point, Pal, about what what gets measured gets managed, and. Yeah, I think it, it is definitely a challenge. The other thing I was going to raise in relation to David's question though is, is the difficulty of having realizing that you need large scale change. So we're just instituting a really major equality change program. And, and you know, we've tried to have a bit of a fanfare around that, say, look, look, you know, this is our commitment to change. We've got this huge four-year program, but also realizing that people want to see change quickly. And there's a sense of impatience and I, I, it's, it's hard to balance that, isn't it? Sort of getting things done that can be seen and visible while also dealing with really quite difficult structural issues in the long term. Anyway, sorry, I'm answering the question myself. That's not, <laughs> that's not my role. Um, I've got another question from Caroline Chapin, who says that she finds it really interesting, the point, you know, the, the point that people have made that inclusion may mean different things for different people. And she's wondering if panelists have some examples on ways to tackle what can be perceived as exclusive behaviours in the day to day workplace. In other words, you know, how do we do that and foster reflexivity in a diplomatic way? I think it's a really interesting uh, question because it certainly um, brings to mind we're having a lot of discussions at the university around allyship and how to be an effective ally, how to sort of challenge some unacceptable behaviours that may go on. Anybody any thoughts on that, how we can challenge exclusive behaviours? It's pretty hard, I think is the, the honest answer. You know, there will be some obvious behaviours that, you know, obviously discrimination, not, not happening, you know, we have to tackle that right ahead, head on. Um, but some of the subtler stuff, um, that's a lot harder to pick up on. And I think the best thing you can do is really listen to your employees and understand how they feel about particular activities. You know, this is a sort of minor example, but um, I've been talking to my team recently about the introverts versus extroverts, because we're, we're a real mix in our team. Some people just love people, can't wait to get back and chatting. Some people actually have quite a lot of social anxiety and a lot has been sort of made worse through the pandemic and this whole experience. And we were talking about whether it would be a nice thing to do to bring in sort of workplace networking, coffee breaks, etc, or whether actually people would feel uncomfortable with it. Um, and the upshot was extroverts love it, introverts would rather be told they'd like to go, you know, if you want to go for a walk during this time you can. <laughs> so again, just finding like those different perspectives on what might seem like, you know, you think a really positive intervention actually others in the business may think, mm, actually from my particular perspective that would exclude me or from my particular expect perspective that would actually be quite a negative experience that that listening and then adapting accordingly to make sure everyone's got a choice about what they engage with because not everything is going to be for everyone. Kathy. Yeah, one thing I've learned from this is that you've got to be if you're in a kind of leadership position you've got to be vigilant all the time because it's really easy just not to know um, if those things, if you haven't experienced them yourself. And, 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 and I'll give you an example. So as someone who's brought up three kids and they're all grown up now and everything like that, I used to know when half term was, off by heart. I used to struggle. I used to invent things in my diary so I could take time off that was in the old days. So, you know, and things like that. And, and, used to, and yes, after the youngest had left home, within two, a year, I found I was organising meetings in half term and somebody said to me, oh, it's half term that week, Cathy. And I was really shocked that I had lost that recognition because it didn't impact on me personally. So I have to kind of constantly remind myself of some of the most obvious reasons in which people might end up in, in, in you know, in, in, in situations where, where, where it's a kind of everyday exclusionary practice that you don't recognise those things people have. And that, that makes me think that... Um, 
we have to have a real vigilance. And I do think that's what I said earlier about inclusion is a bit fragile. So, for example, we're, we're currently, I was really proud that half of our senior team at work are women, but then we're currently advertising for a number of positions and it's going to be very easy to suddenly be in a situation where <laughs> none of them are women anymore, apart from me, or whatever. You know, so it's, it's a kind of, it's like we need an ongoing vigilance. So my first point is I think we need an ongoing vigilance because things change very quickly. But my second point is, is, is um, I think in, in answer to, to Caroline's question, that sometimes we need to know. And I think um, if we don't know that people are finding things like exclusionary, then it's difficult to do something about them. And that isn't an excuse for leaders, because as I say, you know, I've reflected on my own behaviour and, and, and some things I'm, I'm, I'm not that good at, really. And the other thing I would say is in terms of Caroline's point is I, I think it's really important to... Um, create an environment in which people can speak and again that's quite a challenge I think in terms of um you know because some people feel more comfortable in different types of environments um and so it's how do we do that I think is a really big challenge yeah no I, I think you're right and actually there's some really interesting discussion about this in the chat um uh Cara was making the point about you know we need to, humble leadership is maybe a model for the future and and also saying you know we need to ask our staff what matters to them perhaps you know and and it goes back to Pam's earlier point or, or maybe it was Henry's about constant communication and how that's absolutely central to their inclusive environment Devon also asks whether there's a place for a different type of leader um, whose role isn't to manage and administer, but is to care for and consider these issues. I'm going to direct that to Scott because I know he teaches a lot of leadership modules. Okay, thanks, Joe. I'm going to be really brief and then pass across uh, to the rest of the panel. Um, I think it's a it's a super interesting question, Devon, and um, feminist uh, researchers working in business schools. There are a few around the world. Um, I've been have been telling us for for north of twenty five years that um, there is a, a a very different space for leaders to occupy if they um, take feminism seriously, not necessarily as as militant feminists or or what you know the current government calls pink bus feminists. Um, but just as, as people who, who take the principles of feminism seriously in terms of care for others. Um, so yes, there is definitely a place for a different type of leader, absolutely, in, in academic research and also in, in lots of organisations as well, I think, increasingly. Um, not, not to be pessimistic, but, you know, not every organisation is like um, Uber, for example, or, or Amazon. There are lots and lots of progressive organizations out there um, with very different kinds of leaders. Is it the norm for a leader at the moment? I would say no, it's not. Um, you know, from, from you know, the higher education sector to the, the banking and finance sector to uh, a lot of the sectors that Henrietta works with um, as well. It, it, that's not the norm for a leader, as I understand leadership practice at the moment. Um, so I guess there's, there's a gap. Is, is what I would say. I'd agree. I think there's also some really interesting conversations happening at the moment about the role of HR uh, and transforming HR from being human resources to being about people. Because, you know, people aren't numbers on a spreadsheet, they're not a resource, they're people. <laughs> um, and there are some really interesting things that some companies in the region are doing to create very senior roles that are all about people, about engagement, about staff, and actually moving HR from being a transactional sort of, you know, have you logged your absence request forms? <laughs> have you completed X, Y, Z form, et cetera, to a really transformational role within the business and that real understanding of how to get the best out of people. And like I say, actually giving the lead for that a role and the senior management team and having them an equally listened to part of the business. It's a, something that I've seen increasingly over the last couple of years. It's not common yet, definitely not common yet but something I've seen in a, quite a few businesses and particularly some of the more disruptive businesses that are coming through that real approach to people and I think that'll be an interesting influence to keep an eye out for over the coming years. Um, Thanks. Um, Joe I was going to say um, I have seen a shift in um, sort of I guess it's culture so whether it's servient leadership or humility, uh, uh, humble leadership, you know, it's got kind of a change in, so historically I'd say banking, you know, um, it was very alpha male, you know, your power suits and your, you know, your big kind of shoulders and suits and things like that. And actually I've seen a shift away from that alpha male leadership style as well. So I think you uh, touching on the point earlier, there, there's lots of different styles, but, I, but one of the things we've got is inclusion champions. 
So inclusion champions actually um, touch. I mean, like like um, Catherine was saying earlier, you know, some of the um, some of the, some of the things are hidden. For example, disability. You know, you just don't know. And actually, it's such a moving feast. You know, that might be an issue yesterday, but it might be an issue today because of the, the situation we live in. So actually, who can you go to if, you know, if there isn't somebody there? But the inclusion champions are there teaching, educating, um, learning a place to go to, which then assists them at the manage management and leadership team as well. So that's just another route that we're taking. But that's, I just want to add that point. Excellent. Thank you. Great. We have another question um, from Dan. Um, and returning to, to COVID here, Dan says, how do we account for the trauma of the pandemic when considering the efficacy of increased remote working in the last year? And what work is comparing reports on the benefits and weaknesses of remote working currently against pre-pandemic remote and blended working environments? So I guess the question, I mean, just paraphrasing slightly, I mean, it seems that Dan's interested in the extent to which remote working worked because we were in this really, you know, really quite extreme situation. What differences do you think might be needed to make it work in a, in a more sort of um, settled environment? Um, I think if I can come from my perspective, for, for, for us it's worked because we were agile um, we had 50,000 staff working from home, you know, um, that was quite, you know, we were able to do that. We had the tech systems behind that, the systems behind that to make that happen. We were quite agile in terms of um, what equipment do people need, what, what um, desks, chairs, things like that. So sending that out as well. Um, and we were quite agile in terms of um, opening up dialogues for a listening organisation. So I think that 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 kind of really helped as well. Um, I, I would like to see a blend going forward. Um, I think it'd be, and, and if you think about the positive impacts, the positive impacts on climate, you know, so straight away, you know, we're not all making a mass exodus at seven in the morning to make a journey to a place that would take us five minutes normally, but takes us two hours in a, in a car, which we, you know, you know, we're not doing that anymore. And I value that time, you know, and I think also, um, there is a cost saving there as well. We're not all commuting, you know, so actually we've got to, uh, staff have acknowledged that, you know, and offset that. And actually my personal, um, I've had a lot of change in, in the way I look at climate now, you know, I'm not buying fast fashion. Um, I look at why I eat, I look at where I'm spending. And I think for me, my mindset has shifted to what, how I can positively change that as well. Um, I also like the fact that um, it's, it's triggered a conversation on diversity and inclusion. You know, it's always been on the topic. It's always been the subject but actually it's made it happen. Uh, other events have channeled that as well. Recent events have channeled that as well. I've never seen it on the agenda as much as it is now. So what I'd really like to see now is action, um, which is a point that I've heard earlier. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else on that? No, right, well, I'm moving on a little to talk about interventions. So we know there is no silver bullet in terms of suddenly making an organisation more inclusive. Um, I'm very keen to hear your views on what successful interventions you've seen. I mean, Julia in the questions, for example, has asked whether you think reverse mentoring is an effective intervention for in inclusion. So we could think about reverse mentoring, but if not, are there any other interventions you would recommend in terms of increasing inclusion? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk about a couple from my own experience. Um, and the first is uh, in defence of the middle aged white man, Scott. Um, I've actually had um, some fantastic advocates in my career with various, you know, all sorts of different people. But to be fair, it's been the middle aged white guys, senior folks in the business community, senior folks in my business who have been real advocates for me. And that has made a huge difference, you know, having people with power and influence actually sort of standing up for you, sort of dropping in in a meeting, oh, she's good, have you thought about her, etc. That really does make a difference. So that power for all of us, and not just middle-aged white men, but all of us when we get into positions of influence to act as advocates for others in our organisation, um, and look at how we can sort of support and lift others up when we spot actually perhaps they're not getting the opportunities they might deserve for whatever reason. I think that's really important. The other piece, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, Joe, uh, I took part in something called the Uprising Leadership Programme way back when I was at, at uni. It's actually a spin out from the Young Foundation and it's its own, uh, own charity now, Uprising. And what they do is throw together a diverse cohort of young people 
between sort of 19 and 25 uh, and try and teach them how to understand and access power for the good of communities. And it really is all sorts of different people, different backgrounds. I've still got a friendship group of people I would never have met. We've got community organisers, we've got union reps, we've got commercial lawyers, entrepreneurs, <laughs> um, all sorts of different people. And I really think that the power of bringing people together who are very different um, teaching them all, you, we were all equally potential to become leaders, you've all got this potential within you. Having someone who isn't, you know, your mum saying, you're great, you can do this, <laughs> be empowered, know that you've got this potential in you, and then even better, giving you the skills through sort of workshops, training, access to people, access to knowledge, because everything is, you know, everything has its own culture, business has its own culture, politics does, uh, community leadership, etc. and you need someone to open the door and teach you how to understand that language, teach you how to understand how like I say the, the weird things that we do in these different groups you know even networking events it's got its own patter it's got its own language that once you're in and you understand it and you can see it you know how to manage those power structures and how to navigate through it but until someone opens that door for you and gives you that training that idea that understanding it is really hard so I really think you know well that's something I personally did and it's something that is run by a, a charitable organization for young people actually those principles of throwing together very different people very different mindsets experiences backgrounds um, and teaching them how to progress and succeed is something that all organizations can look at proportionate to their size um, but can look at how they can sort of capture some of those core core things within their own sort of talent pipeline development activity within their business. Yeah, thanks Henrietta, that's a really good point. Anybody else like to come forward? I'll, I'll be really brief on that one. I think um, Henrietta has described that, you know, perfectly. Um, in addition, I think um, transparency is incredibly important. So um, transparency of, of data, pay transparency, for example, um, we've seen gender pay gap reporting in the last four or five years, uh, which has provided a, a completely different language to talk about pay, um, especially here in the UK, where we tend to be tend to be quite secretive about pay compared to other, other societies. Um, so any, any kind of data transparency that we can achieve within our workplaces, I think, has to be a good thing in terms of um, EDI. <sighs> Um, I agree with everything that's been said. I think um, every time a door's been open for me, it's, it's been an ally, a supporter who said, and like Henry said, it's, it, is, it is the man who's 50 and white and he holds the power, he holds the key and he opens that door, you know, and, and it's just because of the way the structure is, he is the power holder. And I think when that person does that, oh my God, it's like, wow, like, thank you so much, like literally. And I think that the pilot that I'm doing now is a result of that, having that deep conversation with a mentor saying, this is my experience, this is what I want, this is how it's been, this is a reality of things, this is what I see from my perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's that's opened that conversation of actually how many other people are experiencing this and that. You know, and the last thing you want is talent to leave because of frustration, you know, because you're not going to get that transient move. So I think, yes, we need allies um, and yes, we need genuine allies. So that's really powerful. And I still, still agree with what gets done, gets me what gets measured, gets done. So to your, to your point about data, you know, we need to see what, what does it look like now and what do we, are we aspiring to? So, um, but in a, in a positive construction, construct, constructive way, not in a tick box exercise way, that's really important because that makes a mockery of the whole process. So I think that's really important as well. Yeah, thanks Pam. Kathy, any interventions you want to point to? No, I think you said wonderful things, really good ideas. And I think the issue of, um, uh, as, as you've just said, Pam, what, what gets measured gets done is a really important one. I know I've had this conversation with um, Julia, who asked the question, who's our ED and I person in, in our school. And it's really interesting about it. some companies have been really successful in uh, giving line managers targets in relation to diversity. And I think that's really quite an interesting approach in how I've thought about uh, and talk with Juliet about, could we do that in our kind of context? And I think targets is always difficult. Some of the people have raised, Scott mentioned some of the problems potentially with that earlier. But a number of people have talked about line managers and it, uh, in, in answer to, to other questions we've had earlier. And I wonder whether there, there does need to be kind of uh, more interventions in relation to targeting that particular group. And um, because often, they're the people who most people will, 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 they'll often be kind of gatekeepers to a lot of people's opportunities. And so um, I wonder whether we, we need to think about doing more work 
with, with, with that particular group. Accountability, I guess, for us all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, some, I think some excellent points across there. Um, we've got a slight different tack now. It's a question from Rui, who says, you know, what about the rule of law? And he says, what is your considerations about the role of law to shape equality and justice in workplaces today? So how important is the law? He makes the point that it is, you know, not everybody has the same access to the law and experiences it the same. So yeah, a really interesting issue. What, what point do you see for it? Um, yeah, I don't mind taking that. I'm, I'm a magistrate. So um, I sit on um, sit on the, the Black Country Bench, Wolverhampton, Birmingham, um, Warsaw. And I think it's really, really important. I think that um, when I started, um, a real life example, I, I walked into court and um, someone thought I was the cleaner and basically said, you don't look like a magistrate. I said, I'm a magistrate. Said, you don't look like a magistrate. And the assumption is that all magistrates are look like a certain type, you know, um, older, male. Um, and that was really interesting. So that kind of led me to think like there was, there was no diversity in that field. So I think definitely apply. Um, definitely, if you're interested, go for the magistrate's role, because that, again, um, is reflecting the communities we serve, you know. Um, in terms of the, the question that's been asked, um, yes, I think there's real um, di difference in understanding. Sometimes the jargon in, in law is so, so much. You, you, I see people going through it, but they're not present because they just don't understand. The lawyers speak on behalf of the, 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 the person and, and it's, it's a real um, system issue. So I think, yeah, there's definitely a piece of work that needs to be done there in terms of understanding, in terms of access, and does legal aid's been taken away, you know? Um, there's so much that needs to be done to, to level a playing field there. I, and I can talk about this for days because there's so, so much, but yes, that's a massively loaded, powerful question. Thank you, Pam. Anybody else on the, 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 the role of law within the workplace? Henrietta? Yeah, um, so used effectively and with a significant mind to unintended consequences, um, legal intervention can actually be, be really good for focusing mindsets. So, you know, I, I work with a lot of business owners and you know what, they're unbelievably busy and their number one priority is, okay, guys, are we still going to be here in a year's time? <laughs> you know, are we making enough money to be able to survive? So used effectively, some of those requirements, some of that legal requirement can focus the mind and get something that maybe was, we really want to do it, but it's maybe number 10 on our priority list, right up to number one to make sure that there is at least compliance. So like I say, used effectively, there are some real plus points, but it is always about that mindset of keeping eye, an eye on uh, what are the unintended consequences of going too far and being too prescriptive down that road while they're uh, balancing it out with, yeah, it does, it does get things up the priority list, certainly. Yeah, I can really relate to that, actually, Henrietta. We're at the moment dealing with the digital accessibility and compliance around the, the law there, and, and it is definitely driving our behaviour. I think the interesting thing for us is about then making sure we go beyond compliance and that doesn't end, you know, that isn't the end in itself. It's about what should we do? But yeah, really interesting points. Um, I don't know whether Cathy or Scott wanted to say anything about that or shall I move on to the next question? Great. OK, so... Um, there's a, a really interesting question from an anonymous attendee who says, what responsibility do business leaders have to understand the invisible diversity with their teams and de demonstrate personal allyship? We're coming back to this idea of allyship um, as part of inclusivity. Uh, and what should this look like to transcend merely performative actions? So how can leaders genuinely do this? That's really tough, isn't it? Um, I think from, <laughs> from, from my side, one thing I think, um, you know, that, that allyship is really important, but also understanding your biases. So not just being an ally to people who you might feel, you know, you have the, the emotional connection with. Um, I do a lot of this with whenever I do interviewing, I always interview with one of my colleagues who has both the biases, but has a very different spine. You know, you put me in front of a, a group of people for interview and my natural inclination is going, do you know what? She's young. She doesn't necessarily have all the right experiences, but she's bright and articulate. I think she's great. Where actually my colleague will be on the flip side, very different biases, very different focuses of things that he finds sort of like, a, yeah, that would make them a great candidate. 
And generally, when we throw our feedback together, we go for someone completely different from our top few choices, and it's the right choice. Because <laughs> um, that way, we're taking that bias out of it, taking our own sort of personal feels and going for who actually is going to be the right candidate for the role, taking that all out of it. So that allyship is really important, but also that understanding that as an ally, you do have biases, you are going to want to support people who remind you of you or you otherwise have an affinity for, you know, might remind you of a family member, etc. And really focusing on actually in the business, where are our weak spots in terms of inclusivity? Where are our blind spots that we might not be thinking about, uh, you know, particular, say, hidden areas of inclusivity and focusing on how we can be a better ally as an individual to those particular people and groups? Yeah, that's an excellent point. It's funny, isn't it? Is, is that on the one hand, what we might see as sponsorship, other people might see as unfair treatment. You know, it's, it's it's a really tricky uh, line to tread. Um, did anybody else have any thoughts on that? Um, um, and so, um, one of the tools. I mean, the, the affinity bias is a classic one, isn't it? I think one of the one of the tools is to get. I personally feel get more diversity in that middle management area um, because I think that's going to encourage more diversity going up the ranks. I think if you have a middle management that's very the same, your naturally unconscious bias, your affinity bias is going to be there. So, um, so I think I think one of the one of the things I did recently with um, I, I was reciprocal mentoring um, a member of the, our exec team and um, she was recruiting and naturally she was hiring, it was an IT role, she was hiring all men. And it's just something that was happening, you know, and she said, you know, I, I don't understand what it is. And I said, well, one of the things we came up with, with, okay, so next time you hire, hide all the names on the CV. You know, so something as simple as that, all of a sudden she had more of a diverse pool to select from. So I think it's your your if your unconscious bias sometimes just comes out. And so I think, you know, there's lots of things, you know, and tools that, that can help with that. But, but I think having more of a, a lens on it and, and a focus on it is definitely, and being aware. Um, so what Henrietta said, we always try and have a balanced pan interview panel, you know, um, always a female, always a man. And then if we can broaden it even further, that, that'd be a good thing. Just want to add that. No, it's an excellent point, Pam. Thank you. Kathy, did you want to come in? I was just saying, with everything Pam said, it's all, all, all really sensible. And the other thing I think is sometimes quite useful. Um, so, so I agree, definitely, yeah, we, have, we do have a responsibility, we've all got responsibility. Um, it's having a bit of space. So sometimes we, we, we're doing a lot of recruitment at the moment. Sometimes it's like we, we have to do decisions quite quickly. Um, so, and, uh, and sometimes for kind of Quite ironic reasons. Say, for example, recently we've had to speed up the process. People have to shortlist. So, we've because we've now got a new process in where HR will look at the at, at the ethnic diversity of the candidates we've shortlisted. So, we've kind of shortened the if you see what I mean. The time people have to actually go through the the, the shortlisting process for very good reasons. But I wonder whether actually, you know, so somebody once said to me it was a speaker, Jane Cordell, who was a wonderful speaker we had at the business school, who talked about what it was like to be um, deaf and uh, in, in, in a senior role. And she said the one thing she said to us just just take the time to see if you can think differently. And to kind of stand back and say, right, I've done that, but to re-look at it and just re-look at it, think, is there a different way I can look at this decision I've just made in relation to these candidates? And in many of our jobs, we don't get the time to do that reflection. But I think often if you do do it, it's quite interesting because sometimes you look at different conclusions. And, and, and as you say, we've probably all done training to help us identify our biases but then to make that next step almost I do think needs a bit of space to reflect and it's how we build that space to reflect into those decision making processes I think. Yeah. No, I was going to say and also kind of not going to the same pools for talent naturally you you would be aligned to go to one way because that's who you're thinking but actually doing something disruptive if you do the same things at sign of madness do the same thing and expecting the same different results as sign of madness you know but actually going to different pools and thinking actually what can um you know what can this person bring if they're different the experience is different you know the, 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 the thinking is going to be different it's more disruptive so actually the more diversity you can bring the more more innovative and more diverse that board is and there is um, a competitive edge to that and I know there's a um, study on you know the, the value that um, um, there's a commercial edge to that as well so I think it's looking at more non-conventional pools as well so mm -hmm. that's powerful. I think that's an excellent point. So certainly something we're trying to do at the university because we recognise, and I think Cathy has a point as well in terms of, you know, the time pressure that you kind of sometimes you push to just do what you've always done because you don't stand back and think about it. But actually, often we're not reaching the, the right, well, we're not reaching different communities with our recruitment. So we need to be looking at 
pulling in different people, making them look at the university as a potential employer. So absolutely. And, and, and actually, Marie in the chat makes an interesting point about the emergence of new technologies like Skilled, I'm hoping I've pronounced that right, it might be Skilled, um, which is a talent acquisition platform using AI. Now, I'm, I'm not seeking to just advertise for them, but I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are other um, talent acquisition platforms available. But it is about perhaps using some of those different tools to make us think differently as well about how, how we recruit. Um, Cara asks a really interesting question. It's coming back to the issue around flexibility and um, makes the point that at the moment, all employees have a statutory right to request flexible working. Um, whether the panel think that this should be available from day one, because at the moment the right to request kicks in after 26 weeks continuous service. So A, should that, that be available to employees from day one? Should it be like the default position? But also on what stage do you have this conversation with your employees to let them know about this right? So how should leaders let people know about this? Any thoughts? So there's the the official answer, which is, uh, you know, all, all staff are briefed in their uh, induction processes through HR about the, you know, different triggers and different opportunities to do things like right to request flexible working. Um, I think the reality is it's different for different organisations, depending on the roles in question. You know, it's a lot easier for me to sit here and say, I tell my team from day one, if you want to work from home for a day, that's fine by me. Just let me know from advance, stick it in the calendar um, and, uh, you know, totally fine you want to flex your hours because you've got childcare and responsibilities on Monday and Tuesday yeah fine by me um but that's that's me and my team um whereas you know if perhaps I had a team on a construction site or um you know in a, a manufacturing business for instance actually the the sort of requirements and the challenges of doing that within sort of those sorts of shift patterns and those sorts of requirements are very very different so it does does vary organization to organization I think it's right that people find their own balance of what they do uh, but also as you say that transparency piece of being clear and upfront with people what is available how the policies work and how to access it is really important from day one absolutely anybody else any thoughts on that I was going to say just being really clear um language you know speak clarity of language you know speaking basic English you know HR policies are wrapped up in so much jargon and you know you click on that link then you go to the next link and I think I often find that things like this are trigger led you know someone is asking about can I have flexible working I think there's a conversation a deeper conversation of what's led to that so I can only go back to that listening manager that kind of empathy um so so you know um and I think that that's key but um, monthly one-to-ones should or week you know depending on your, on your business you know they should reveal conversations like that and I think you know and I think how are one-to-ones done are they always performance orientated or are they people orientated so I think there's again that line manager issue comes into that are we asking the question how are you or you know a, a real open question are we starting off with this is your performance last month you know mm -hmm. um so I think it's you know how it's managed but I, I often look out for trigger points if, if someone is asking if my, my reporters are asking me or um you know is is this something I could do I think okay tell me tell me tell me why you're asking you know what what's triggered that conversation because clearly there's something that's made them think that um, and it might be that that policy that they're asking for that requirement isn't the right fit there's other stuff they just don't know about it um excellent thank you well we, we, we're coming towards the end so I've got one last question and then I'll ask the panel to just summarize their reflections but uh, Monique has asked for the panel's views around utilising external panel members on selection panels, for example, customers, the community, students, and, and asks if, if you've seen good examples of this in practice. I think it's a great idea and it's uh, something that, you know, again, in terms of transparency, um, I seem to be talking about transparency this morning, but um, uh, selection processes are one of the, the, the least transparent parts of, mm. of how we build organizations and um, they're, they're where a lot of discrimination happens, um, whether conscious or unconscious, it, 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 it still comes to um, exclusion. So I think it's a super idea, um, but partly because it just makes everybody moderate their behavior a little bit, um, which um, has to be, I think, a, a good thing in the moment. Um, but then also because it, it just helps to involve all of those people in your organization, as you say, customers, community, students for the university, you know, these, 
these are all incredibly important people. And the, the, the more they're involved in how organizations operate, then surely the better. Yeah, excellent. And any other thoughts from anyone? No, I think we probably all agree with Scott's answer there. I think, yeah, it, it is just an incredibly good idea. And if, if we're hoping to reflect our community in our staff base, it, it, it just makes total sense, I think. Um, right, so we are coming to the end. I'd like to invite each of the panellists just to spend a minute or so giving us you know, their, their, their reflections on the session, any key messages they've found have come out of it, or key messages indeed they'd like to make. Um, and I'll ask Henrietta to go first, if that's okay. Yeah, I think one of the key ones that's come out from everyone's, uh, everyone's contribution today, I think, has been around communication and clarity. Um, and being very transparent, thinking about the language we use, thinking about how we open up understanding and really listen as well not just transmit to workforces about, you know, what we want to see in terms of inclusivity and leadership and diversity, et cetera, but actually genuinely really listen to individual employees and understand where they are. Because um, while we, we can look at sort of and should look at certain groups and how groups feel about inclusivity in the workplace, actually individuals as well will have their own perspectives. Many, you know, will be coming at this from very different angles. So getting that very personal view, I think is really important. I think the, the other piece is, you know, we're, we're having this conversation today, but obviously we're, we're having it during the pandemic where actually a lot of the impact of the pandemic has shown the fact that there are still huge structural inequalities in our society. You know, I think um, there was a question in the chat earlier about why is there still a gender pay gap? Well, you know, you, you look at the impact of the pandemic on women's employment, in particular working class women's employment, where they've been really disproportionately impacted and you see, well, those structural inequalities are still there. Same with, um, I think there's an FCA report on the impact of the pandemic on the ethnic minority pay. Young people, there's over half a million more young people unemployed right now than there was, you know, over a year ago. So these inequalities are still there in different ways. And I think this conversation today is was important anyway. It was always going to be important. But following this, following Black Lives Matter, following the protests, following Sarah Everard as well, you know, you, you inequalities are being felt so keenly by groups at the moment. And it's really important, you know, and someone's just put disabled people as well, absolutely mental health and well-being. You know, this is all still there and we've got to deal with it as a society. And people spend most of their lives working. So there's no better place to deal with inclusivity than in the workplace and take some of what we've discussed today back in and put it into practice. Fantastic. Thanks, Henrietta. Pam? Um, to build on everything that um, Henrietta said as well, I think, I, think, um, I think we all have a key role to play um, as large organisations, companies, corporates, education and delivery roles. I think we are custodians of our ecosystem. And I think that we can make the change. So it's really important that we're having this dialogue, but I think I hope it's just not limited to the pandemic and the doors open in June and we will forget about this and go back to our old rosy world. I think it's important to keep that dialogue going, but I think it's also important to see actionable change. I mean, I saw a study somewhere, I mean, I haven't got that exact, but I think 40% of young people are worried, worried they're never going to get a job or something, you know. Um, their education has been impacted, you know, um, everything's online, isolation, um, I think uh, ethnic diversity, women, everything that's been mentioned, I think everything's so polarised. Um, but that, but it's always already been there. It's almost always been there. It's just that it's been um, um, been brought to the attention now. So I think that uh, we have a real, real role to play um, as custodians, and I really hope to see action and change. Fantastic, thank you, um, Scott. Uh, so I think I've learned today about the importance of line management, which I hadn't really been thinking about. And it's been really, really good to hear that conversation and also trust. Um, and I have been sort of semi-conscious of trust um, over the last 12 months, partly because the um, University of Birmingham has done a really good thing, I think, in promoting um, best endeavours over the last 12 months, which I think has been a really nice way to work. If we could retain that forever, that would be fantastic. And first, that everyone will always do their best at work. That would be great. Um, but and then I think also finally, um, just to keep thinking about, about the importance of not leaving ED and I to one side um, as, as we emerge somehow from the pandemic um, over the next six to 12 months, because there's a very strong possibility that ED and I will get forgotten about 
in the rush to rebuild in a, in a practical or economic sense. And I think that's that's super important what Pam was saying just a moment ago. Thanks. And Cathy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I've learned a lot from our other panellists, actually. I've actually written some notes of things I've got to think about, about doing, <laughs> maybe not today, but on the agenda. So thank you to our colleagues for that and also to all the people who asked questions. Um, it feels to me that, um, building on what, what other colleagues have just said, really, that we've talked about COVID and we know what that means now, but I actually think we're in quite an ambiguous position going forward because we don't know what the next six months is going to be like. We don't know what the next year is going to be like. And certainly in my lifetime, I don't think we've ever had this kind of period where literally everything is up in the air. You know, the normal patterns of employment are not the same as they were. Um, opportunities are not there, but different types of opportunities might be like working at home. And so I'd like to feel that um, there's almost a kind of space um, where then we might actually have, I hate this phrase, but people use it, a window of opportunity, if you like. There might be a space because we don't know what's going to happen where we can really think about progressing this agenda. Because often when there's a space and, and nobody's quite clear what's going to happen, there is an opportunity to get in there and push something. And so I guess I'm, I'm ending up feeling quite positive that, 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 that where we're in at the moment might be an opportunity, despite all the obvious negative impacts that, that the pandemic has had on people in particular groups, as our speakers and, and our people in the chat have pointed out. So I think um, perhaps as we go back to whatever a new normal is, or we start creating how work is going to look like, now is the time to really think about how to act on this issue. I mean, I know we've all been thinking about it for a long time, but to like jump into that space and kind of own it and say, as we're planning this return to it, as we're planning this, as we plan this, 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 and this, where does the and i fit in? So I'm feeling like it's it's even more time to act than usual. Thanks, Jo. Thank you. Um, and we really are running out of time, so I'm not going to spend much time with my own reflections other than to say thank you to the panel so much. I have learned so much this morning. It's been really thought provoking, you know, around issues around line management, around how we manage flexible working and also creating a culture around communication. There's just so much there to think about, which has been fantastic. And I love your term plan, custodians of the ecosystem, because I think we can think about us all at all levels in an organisation as custodians of that ecosystem. Them. So I'm going to finish there. Thank you so much. But I'll just hand over to Kate Jeremy, I think, who just wants to um, finish off the session. Thank you so much, Joe, and thank you so much to the panellists. It's been absolutely fantastic this morning listening in to your uh, knowledgeable and intelligent discussions that have been going on. And it's also really, really eye-opening for me, looking at unconscious bias, looking at how we think differently. So thank you very much. Hugely appreciated, uh, Professor Joe Dubley for hosting, Professor Cathy Cassell, uh, Pam Shimar, Henrietta Brilli and Dr Sc Scott Taylor. Thank you so much. So just a, one minute's worth of uh, wrap up from me, um, just to say that this uh, event has been part of the Growth Through People um, campaign through uh, Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce. Through the month long campaign, there are a number of other events going on and there are two on the screen now uh, that will be um, really, really useful and worth attending. And also uh, the actual conference itself, which is going to be on the, the 30th of March, is uh, free for you all to attend. Uh, so please do join in. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. So just to uh, say um, to follow the University of Birmingham Business Club on Twitter and on LinkedIn so you can find out further events and future opportunities around funding and business support from the University of Birmingham. It's fair to say that uh, there is a lot of engagement with the university that you can take part in some of the research that, uh, that Joe and Cathy and Scott have talked about. So please do get in touch at UOB Business Club and at our email address. And I really look forward to seeing you at the next events, which will be uh, in um, April, May and June time. And we'll be posting that information as and when we have dates confirmed. So thank you so much again, everybody. And we really, really look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>